For the past little while, I have been covering cool secrets that you may not know from every Pokemon generation. We started with Gen 9, then wrapped back around to Gens 1 and 2, and now it's time to cover Gen 3. The Hoenn games are obviously iconic, and there are a lot of cool secrets about them that you may not know, so let's go ahead and check them out. So Gen 3 is noteworthy for a lot of things, but one of those things in particular was the introduction of the running shoes. These allowed you to move faster throughout the overworld and were a huge quality of life improvement for the series. However, Ken Sugimori, the art director of the series and one of the founding members of Game Freak, was actually against including them in the game. In an interview with Nintendo Dream Magazine that released around the time of Ruby and Sapphire's debut, Sugimori revealed his objection to the feature, as when the topic of the running shoes was brought up in the interview, he said, I was opposed to it. I said, we don't need sprinting. I kept insisting that an adventure is about walking. I absolutely love Sugimori. He's a legend but it's definitely good that they opted not to go with his suggestion here, because the running shoes were definitely one of the nicest additions of the Gen 3 era. By the way, this interview was translated by Pokemon and video game historian Dr. Lava, and I'll be referring to it a few more times throughout the video, so a big shout out goes to him. Another thing that the Hoenn games are well known for is their concept of version-exclusive evil teams. Not only are there two evil teams in these games instead of just one, but they fight against each other as well as you, and as mentioned, differ between each version in terms of the role they take on and who you face as the antagonist. It's a super cool and unique part of Ruby and Sapphire, but originally, Team Magma and Team Aqua were just going to be one team instead of two. In the same aforementioned interview, Ruby and Sapphire's director, Junichi Masuda, said, On one hand, there's Team Magma, and on the other, there's Team Aqua. Actually, they were originally together, not separate. Then, around this time last year, we thought it was actually more interesting if there were two organizations, with Team Magma in the red game and Team Aqua in the blue game. It's interesting to think about what Ruby and Sapphire would be like with just one central evil team, as not only would it have made the games significantly different, but this singular team would have likely been very different to the very distinct and opposed Team Magma and Team Aqua. Speaking of evil teams, Masuda also mentions in this interview that the idea of possibly giving Team Rocket ties to the Hoenn region was floated around as well, and in particular, to the Moss Deep Space Center. Masuda said, When we designed Hoenn, we also made a rocket launch pad, and we had ideas like, maybe that's where Team Rocket came from. But we decided it was better not to spell things out concretely especially as far as the media is concerned. It sounds like this was probably just an idea and probably didn't get too far past that, but Team Rocket in Hoenn could have been pretty crazy, and it's crazy to hear about ideas like this that would have completely changed Pokemon as we know it if they had actually happened. Let's go ahead and shift gears a little bit though and talk about some in-game stuff. One neat little thing in the games that could easily fly right over your head, but is still pretty cool, is that some of the default names of Brendan and May that you can choose from when you first start the games actually reference the game that you're playing. For example, in Ruby version, one of Brendan's optional names is Landon, as in land, and one of May's is Terra, which means Earth. In Sapphire, Brendan can be named Sean, which has the word C in it, and May can be named Marina, as in Marine, which also refers to the sea as well. Speaking of May, she is obviously well known for her portrayal in the anime, and a part of this portrayal is her little brother, Max. 
While Max doesn't appear in the games like May does, it seems that his design was most likely directly based on the appearance of the male school kid from the Hoenn title. When riding the cable car to or from Mount Chimney down to Route 112, a short cutscene plays of the player riding in the car. There isn't anything too remarkable about this cutscene, except that there is a 1 in 64 chance that various NPCs will be seen hiking up the mountain when this cutscene plays, such as the hiker, camper, or picnicker. The games were also supposed to feature the chance of seeing a Poochiana and Zigzagoon as well, but due to a programming error, they unfortunately don't appear. Similar to this, it's also possible to look out of the portholes while on the SS Tidal, while sailing from Slateport City and Lily Cove City, and see the ship sailing on Route 134 as it makes its way between the two cities. I also love talking about Pokemon design secrets, so let's get into a little bit of that. Something that makes the design of the fighting type Makuhita kind of ingenious is that its head comes to, well, a head, right at the top where it has some kind of knot-shaped protrusion. Well, if you look closely, you'll see that this makes Makuhita's head resemble the shape of a plastic shopping bag forming the pun that this Pokemon is a punching bag, since it is a fighting type, and this is also supported by the target-like circles that Makuhita has on its cheeks. Something similar to this also happens with the electric type Manectric too, and this is subtle so it's kind of mind-blowing when you notice it, but Manectric's face is actually meant to resemble a crocodile clip which are used to establish a temporary electrical connection with an object, and are commonly seen in the form of jumper cables. This is especially prevalent in the shape of Manectric's snout and the jagged shape of its mouth. Swalot is another Hoenn Pokemon, and it is kinda gross because it is based on a stomach or possibly even a gallbladder. This is evident in the category of its pre-evolution Gulpin, who is literally known as the Stomach Pokemon. But originally, Swalot was meant to be something else entirely. Found within the recently leaked source code of Ruby and Sapphire was some Pokemon data from earlier stages in development, and this data lists Swalot as the Purse Pokemon instead of the poison bag Pokemon like it is known in the final. It seems that the motif of swallowing everything whole was actually going to be a little less literal for Swalot originally, as it apparently was going to be based on a purse and the trope of purses swallowing everything whole, meaning that purses will often become so cluttered that people will lose things within them. And if I must say, I think that this is a lot more creative and funny than just being based on a literal stomach. This next one is not something that has been conclusively confirmed, but it seems to me like there is more to the story here, which is why I wanted to bring it up. It very much seems to be the case that Tropius was possibly going to be Winona's signature Pokemon originally, instead of Altaria. This is due to the fact that not only is it flying type, which is Winona's specialty, but it also represents Four Tree City perfectly where Winona resides, as not only being a flying type Pokemon, but also being very tropical and jungle-like, which is exactly what Fortree City is. Despite this though, she didn't even have a Tropius in Ruby and Sapphire, and didn't end up getting one until Emerald. Fortree City, Winona, and Tropius just seem to be too perfect of a fit to me, for there have not to have been a deeper planned connection here. So it's possible that something like this was indeed planned, like I said, but then they decided to make Altaria Winona's ace instead, possibly because it's way more of a traditional flying type than Tropius is. Another thing that Ruby and Sapphire are noteworthy for are being the only Pokemon games, even to this day, that feature the player's father. 
Many fans have wondered why this is, and it's most likely for the most wholesome reason you could imagine. Ruby and Sapphire are the babies of director Junichi Masuda, as these were the first Pokemon games he ever directed. As such, he put a ton of personal inspiration into them, in the same way that Red and Blue were very personally inspired by Satoshi Tajiri. Masuda is on the record as stating that Hoenn is inspired by the Kyushu region of Japan, because that's where his family would go on summer vacation, and he wanted to recreate his memories of summer vacation there with the games. This is also why Hoenn is much more tropical in nature, as if it is a vacation setting, and this is most likely why we see the player's father in these games as well, especially considering that your whole family comes to Hoenn together from the Johto region at the start of the games. So, basically, your dad being in the games is most likely due to the fact that it's meant to help represent Masuda's childhood family vacations. And if that's not a reason to love these games, I don't know what is. Ruby and Sapphire weren't all sunshine and rainbows for Masuda, however, as he's also stated that they were the hardest games for him to make, at least as of a few years ago. According to Game Informer circa 2017, an interview that they conducted with Masuda revealed that the original Hoenn titles were the most difficult ones for him to complete. According to the article, this largely had to do with the pressure of making a successful Pokemon title amid the period of time when these games came out where Pokemon was on a bit of a downtrend, and many thought the franchise was dead. To give you an idea though of just how difficult these games were to develop for Masuda, he was actually hospitalized as a result of them. In that Game Informer interview, he said, I got really stressed out and had to go to the hospital and had some stomach issues and had to get a camera inserted and they didn't know what it was. Very stressful. The night before release, I had a dream that it was a complete failure, a total nightmare. So, as you can see, Masuda really cared about these games and that they were successful. So, next time you play Ruby, Sapphire, or Emerald, be sure to say thank you to Masuda, because he literally ended up in the hospital over the work that he put into these games. Another really cool thing from this Game Informer interview is that Masuda knew what the Gen 4 games were going to be, even at the very beginning of Gen 3's development. He said, quote, When we were first developing it, I had the idea in mind that it would be Ruby and Sapphire, and then the next games, including the titles, would be Diamond and Pearl and in between we would do the remakes, Fire Red and Leaf Green, so we could create this structure where you could take the Pokemon from the Kanto region to the Diamond and Pearl games. This provides a cool bit of insight on just how far ahead Game Freak are when it comes to their development cycle, and it's pretty fascinating to think about that they had the Sinnoh region in mind before we even knew that Hoenn was a thing. Let's get back into the games themselves, though. When Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire came out, many people were shocked at the huge redesign that Mauville City received. It went from being a standard town to one that was built within a dome-like structure, is largely indoors, and is one of the most unique Pokemon towns of all time. Despite the shock at this big change though, Mauville City's redesign is actually referenced in the original Ruby and Sapphire, when Watson says before your gym battle with him, I've given up on my plans to convert the city I have, and so I put my time into making door traps in my gym. So it seems that in the Mega Timeline, he was simply able to complete these plans after all, and that Mauville City's redesign wasn't exactly as random as it might have first appeared on the surface. There's also some environmental storytelling that goes on in these games as well, as it is possibly implied that the Elite Four member Drake was the captain of the abandoned ship that sits on Route 108. 
While nothing of the sort is ever explicitly mentioned, Drake wears an outfit that resembles that of a ship captain, but it appears worn and tattered. This seems to fit in quite well with the abandoned ship also being worn and tattered, meaning that the games could be trying to tell us that this is the case without actually telling us. And it seems all the more likely due to the fact that this possible connection is even strengthened in the remakes, as it's revealed that Drake has a relationship with Mr. Briny and Mr. Stone and the latter is obviously president of the Devon Corporation, who is implied to be involved with C. Mauville, which is what replaced the abandoned ship in the remakes, which seems to further tie Drake to this area of Hoenn, regardless of whether it's the abandoned ship or not. Back to the development side of things though, Ruby and Sapphire were actually going to be a lot more similar to Black and White originally, in the sense that they were originally only going to feature new Pokemon. In the previously mentioned Dr. Lava interview on Ruby and Sapphire's development, Junichi Masuda said this, from the early stages of development until past the halfway point, we planned on Ruby and Sapphire featuring nothing but brand new Pokemon. But later, when it came time to balance things out, we realized there weren't enough of certain types, and decided to add in older Pokemon to fill the gaps. This essentially means that, just like Black and White, Ruby and Sapphire were planned as sort of a soft reboot of the series, and remnants of this reboot idea can still be found within the final games. For example, there are extreme similarities with Pokemon Red and Blue at the start of the Hoenn game such as encountering a city with a gym that you don't battle till later, having a forest location right before the first gym, having that first gym be rock type, and in the remakes, they even went so far as to make the Rustboro gym into a museum, just like the Pewter Museum in Red and Blue. And speaking of Rustboro City, an early pre-release webpage on Nintendo of Japan's website that advertises Ruby and Sapphire shows a pre-release screenshot of Rustboro that shows some key differences to the final product, such as a different building being present in the Rustboro Gym's location, and an additional lamp post being behind this building as well. The gym not being where it is in the final is a pretty big shakeup, so it would definitely be interesting to know where the gym was going to be located during this stage of development. This same webpage also shows some differences for Fall Arbor Town as well, such as the color of the roof of the house that can be seen in this screenshot being slightly different to the final games, and a house also being located where the Pokemart is in the final meaning that the Pokemart was located somewhere else within the town, or that Fall Arbor possibly didn't even have a Pokemart to its name at this stage. Continuing with the beta stuff, let's talk about Blaziken, because something interesting was revealed about it in that source code leak I mentioned earlier. First off, according to this data, Blaziken was originally known as the Cockfight Pokemon, which is, uh, quite the colorful description. But more interesting here is Blaziken's Pokedex entry from this time period. It says, by flapping its wings, it generates high temperature heat waves that turn plant matter into char. It can barely see in dark areas. If you didn't catch it, this dex entry confirms that Blaziken had wings at this time, which it does not in the final games, meaning that its design was changed up fairly significantly compared to whatever this design looked like. All of this info is also circa May 2002 which is only six months prior to the release of the games, so it seems that Blaziken was being refined right down to the very last minute, which is pretty cool. Another starter Pokemon from this time period that has something pretty crazy to share is Grovile. 
Now, I mentioned this in another video recently, but this is definitely a Hoenn secret worth sharing again, because it reveals that Grovile and Archaeops, of all things, could be related, at least conceptually. This is because there is a Pokemon mentioned in this Ruby and Sapphire source code data that is known as the Archaeopteryx Pokemon, which is what Archaeops is. This Pokemon also has its own dex entries, but Grovile also has these same exact dex entries at this time, as well as the same height and weight as this Archaeopteryx Pokemon. Additionally, one of the dex entries says that the scales on its arms have come to resemble wings, which is very reminiscent of what Grovile looks like with leaves on its arms that also resemble wings, which in a nutshell suggests that this Archaeopteryx Pokemon, which was likely revived as a concept into Archaeops in Gen 5, eventually became Grovile in terms of the design that this Pokemon had at this stage. And that is just absolutely bonkers, because you would never in a million years think that these Pokemon could be connected. And it really just goes to show that just about anything could be going on behind the scenes at Game Freak. And we really do not have any kind of clue of the kind of insane stories that go into these Pokemon's creation. This next one is one of my favorites, because it's about how Verdanturf Town, one of the most peaceful towns in all of Pokemon, is possibly based on a town in Japan that almost had an atomic bomb dropped on it. Basically, Verdanturf Town is known for its wind currents that keep the ash of Mount Chimney from falling all over the town. It's also located in the central western part of Hoenn, which, if you line it up with its real-world equivalent, Kyushu, lines up somewhat closely with a town in real-life Japan known as Kokura, which is noteworthy in this case because it almost had an atomic bomb dropped on it in World War II, but was spared due to the weather which sounds an awful lot like Verdanturf Town being spared from Mount Chimney's Ash thanks to the weather as well. It's almost like it's a Pokemon family-friendly version of that story. The connections also go way deeper than I can get into here, so I would recommend checking out this video if you would like to know more. But, uh, yeah, like I said, we really don't have any idea how crazy some of these origin stories can really get. Why don't we go ahead and take a quick look at Oraz, though, because we haven't done a ton of that yet. In Oraz, the iconic tune known as Happy Birthday can be heard in the games when you visit a Pokemon Center on your birthday. However, this only happens in the Japanese versions of the titles. Everywhere else, you'll only hear a special version of the Pokemon Center theme instead. And this is because, inexplicably, Warner Music Group had a control over the song's copyright at the time, which meant that the song sadly had to be removed from international versions. However, the Happy Birthday song would later enter the public domain shortly thereafter, when it was determined that the copyright was invalid. And that, my friends, were 25 secrets about the Hoenn games. Be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed, and let me know in the comments if you learned something today, or if you have something of your own to share. Subscribe if you're new for more content as well, and share this video around so I can keep this series going. I'll be back soon with another video, and until then, as always, thank you guys so much for watching this one, I really appreciate it, and I will smell you guys later.